Hello, my name is Sophia Emanuel, and I am a re-entry program manager with Heartland Alliance. Whether it's Ready Chicago or the network of healthcare providers across Nigeria, Heartland Alliance knows what works to build safer and more resilient communities, access to health and healing, safety and justice, and economic opportunity. At Heartland Alliance, we believe perspective is extremely important in guiding us to better partner with the community and policing will not be successful without understanding what the people in the community need. In our continuing efforts to achieve equity and opportunity for all, today's discussion will delve into the police reform movements on the ground in Nigeria and the US. We have convened leaders from our global alliance to discuss their own perspectives on these challenges. Joining me today is Bartholomew Ochanye, also known as OBB, He's the country director for Heartland Alliance International in Nigeria, and Eddie Bocanegra, senior director of Ready Chicago. Thank you both for being here today with me. Eddie, can you tell us about how participants in your programs have experienced their interactions with police? What do you think police reform ideally would look like for them? Thanks, Sophia. It's a really complicated question to answer, especially given the uh, amount of time that we have. But here's what I would say, uh, in most cases, the men in our program, and I'm going to just give you a quick snapshot in terms of who it is that we're serving. Most of our men in Rich Chicago have between a 17 and 18 arrests and between four and five felony arrests. As a matter of fact, over 80% of the folks that we have in our program, the participants that are actively involved with us, uh, according to police and hospital data, have been a victim of violence. In, in most cases, they were victims when they were a young person. So why is this important? What's important because we know that this investment that we're seeing a high increase of violence are, is very concentrated. They're concentrated in certain pockets of our city and particularly with certain uh, uh, race and culture, most often African-American and Hispanic communities. The interesting part about this is that in, in most cases, the first experience that people in these communities have with law enforcement is actually, or with the criminal justice system, is actually with the police. Officer, police officers that are in the community that are trying to serve and protect the community. But in reality, for many of these folks, they often question who are they trying to serve and who are they really truly protecting? And so when we think about victimization, we think about criminal justice, they're pretty much uh, two sides of the same coin. And the men that we have in our program, at, at a very young age, they realize that the police are not necessarily there to truly protect them. And there is a mistrust. And that is a mistrust that unfortunately uh, is the result of not only uh, the way that communities see each other or other communities see these particular communities, but it's also in the way that um, young people and others in these communities think about their public safety. Thank you, Eddie. And OBB, how is the situation similar or different in Nigeria? How have participants in programs there experienced their interactions with police? Yeah, thank you very much for, for the question. Yeah, so the situation in Nigeria is very similar uh, with what you have in, in the US in the sense that it is violence against, you know, um, uh, on armed citizens and, um, and and largely largely harmless citizens. And for our program in Nigeria, there has been several arrests of individuals, actually unlawful arrests of individuals, just because of how they look or because of how they dress or because of the dreadlocks they have. These occurrences with police are are detrimental to the mental health of a community adding to the mistrust of institutions and systems among black and brown communities. So we believe that mental health is a critical element of building overall health. What are some strategies that Heartland Alliance is employing to combat the mental health consequences? OBB, we can start with you. Oh, so certainly, so for Heartland Alliance, the population we work with uh, at the receiving end of you know, all kinds of um, um, traumatic experiences, both from uh, families and also from you know, the society, 
because they don't understand why individuals are different, either because they are LGBTQ or because they are, you know, sex workers or because they, they use drugs or because they are trans persons and just because they are different, you know. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, a, a stigma against them. There's a lot of discrimination against them, which result to a lot of um, traumatic experiences because they ask themselves, but this is who I am. Why am I treated this way? So it's, it's a lot of um, trauma that the community face, and it is worsened by the fact that some of them are criminalized. The Heartland Alliance program has psychologists on our program that tend to respond to some of these um, situations. We have hotlines that they call into and, um, and, and, and discuss the situations they face. Uh, we also have lawyers on our program that find their way to the police stations where these individuals are, are arrested and, 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 um, you know, and detained. And some of these lawyers are able to support us to get them out of, 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 of detention and also link them to other uh, mental health and psychosocial support services available on our program. Thank you, OBB. Um, and Eddie, what are we learning about levels of trauma among ready participants due to community police violence? And what are some strategies that we are employing to combat the mental health consequences for them? Yes, Sophia. So let me let me take a couple of minutes just to uh, share a couple couple stories. Uh, about a year and a half ago or so, we had a young man doing very well. His name was Devon, and he was he came from a family where parents, his mother was struggling with substance abuse. He had a younger sibling. He ended up moving with his aunt's house. He came to the program because he had two other felony arrests with, with gun charges, and slowly. You can see the, the evolution of his thinking and the way that he's viewing himself in the community, the way that he's being proactive about some things and taking advantage of, of, of the resources that are being presented to him. Long story short, through a partnership that we have here with the sports team in Chicago, with the Chicago Bears, he was able to go out with a few of his peers to one of the camps where they were interacting with some of the uh, sports athletes. Um, Later that day, you know, he came back, he's gloating to his friends. The following day, he goes to work, he's excited. As he's walking back home, he's walking with two other of his peers, two other of his colleagues that are part of British Chicago. And instead of taking the traditional route that, it, that he would take to go to his house, because keep in mind, in, this, in these neighborhoods, as it is in most neighborhoods in urban cities, you have to navigate one city block to another city block because of gang dynamics or police, you know, uh, harassment. In this case, they were navigating some of the gang issues. They decided to cut or take, take a shortcut. That shortcut was simply a one city block difference. And a young man must have recognized them. He started chasing them. Shots were fired. Devon felt you know, on, on the streets, right by the curb. And then this young man who must have been no older than 18 walked up to him and unloaded the rest of his clip. Devon was pronounced dead. And while there's a lot that I could talk about what happened with him and his family, I wanna take a second or two to say, the way that we responded was, we needed to make sure that the two individuals, the two peers, that was what that witnessed Devon being shot and killed received the proper support. Sometimes the proper support isn't always received in that moment. So we have to be patient and recognize that when the individual is ready, we need to be there. And we need to kind of truly follow through and, and ensure that healing for many of these men and women does not happen overnight, specifically when we're asking them to heal in the same environments, in the same communities that have caused so much harm. It is counterintuitive. And so we were able to dispatch staff to support this young man and his family. We were able to dispatch a team to support the two peers. And then we were able to dispatch a team to also support the staff that work so diligently and hard who are committed up to, to, to serve this population so they too could feel that they had space to process, that sometimes the work could become very cynical. Sometimes we feel, are we making an impact? 
And we wanted to make sure that we cared for the people that we are entrusted, who are entrusted to serve this population. OBB, is there anything that you'd like to add about, you know, what are things that we could be doing around mental health and trauma, but we aren't doing just yet? The, 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 the truth is that the, the, the rate at which people suffer violence uh, is so high that we, we need a lot more investment in um, structures that will be able to respond to, to these um, needs. And for the community that we serve that suffer a lot of hate crime, I'm talking about the LGBTI persons, I'm talking about you know, sex workers, I'm talking about people who use drugs, I'm talking about other minority groups that are criminalized, you, you find out that the trauma they face is on a daily basis, on a daily basis. And so the, the, there is need for Heartland Alliance to look at ways to build capacity in the general pop, uh, 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 pop society to ensure that we have individuals that are able to, to respond. Lastly, uh, we have some uh, individuals that have gone to school to study psychology or clinical psychology, but sometimes they need to be uh, uh, trained on some of the peculiarities of the needs you know, uh, of the community that we serve so that they can use their skills to be able to provide those services um, um, uh, adequately. Thank you very much. So that, that uh, leads um, nicely to the next topic, which is about crisis intervention. Um, so especially in the United States, the police have been responsible for the role of crisis intervention for people experiencing domestic violence and mental health issues. As mental health workers and human rights advocates, we'd like to know more about your perspective on how to transform our systems to best respond to these crises. Sure, Sophia. So let me start by saying this. So. Um, in my earlier career, about 11, 12 years ago, I started working, uh, doing what we call street outreach and interruption work. Really what that meant is uh, I would be deployed into communities in Chicago where there were hot spots, where there was an increase of shootings and homicides. And the idea was I would be deployed there to help reduce, to connect with the people who are more likely to be shooters or victims and try to stop the cycle of violence there. And so, that, that afforded me a couple of different things. One of them, it, it allowed me and it gave me the privilege, uh, and it's a, a very sad one, to meet many families, many mothers in most cases, who had to bury their children at a very young age. And as a result of that, I realized that in our city at the time, there really wasn't a lot of support services, whether it was clinical or otherwise, to help guide uh, many of these mothers and families through the process of grieving. Well, what can we do differently? Why is that important? Well, it's important because if we're thinking about mistrust or building trust with the police, sadly, this year alone in Chicago, we're probably going to have about 800 homicides. That is more homicides than the last 20 plus years here in Chicago. To me, those represent also not only, and I'm not going to speak so much on the, on the, on the suffering and pain behind that, but also as a way that the police could capitalize by building relationships with these families, building a rapport with them and leveraging these families to be ambassadors in many, in many, in many ways of, of both peace, justice, but also of how they could work with, with the police department. That also means that the police, going to your larger question, have to rethink about how they deploy officers into the field. So what do I mean by that? Well, about 80% or so of, our, of, of police calls, right, is to respond to young people congregating in corners. It is to address domestic violence issues, uh, disputes. I don't want to undermine any of them. But what I'm saying is we spend so much time, so much tax de- taxpayers' dollars to pay police to respond to that when there could be a mediator in between. Maybe it's social workers, you know, maybe it's another you know, nonprofit like Heartland, maybe it's other institutions that could potentially be responding to other less, um, less cases. And again, I don't wanna undermine any of those situations because they're all important. And perhaps in doing so, police 
could leverage the resources and focus more on addressing shootings and homicides, for example, trying to solve some of those cases. Because at the end of the day, uh, people want to feel much safer in their community. Uh, OBB, how about in, in Nigeria? Um, do the police play <clears throat> a similar role um, in crisis intervention in cases of domestic violence or mental health issues? Is it similar there? So, but the issue is about uh, uh, trainings. If the issue is about, you know, um, um, even the, the, the welfare of the police itself is a different ball game altogether. Now, I have relatives who work with the police force and, you know, going to, their, to the places where they live, uh, the barracks where they live, you, you cannot live in those kind of environments and think straight because the environment is not properly taken care of. And beyond that, some of them are even unable to afford uniforms you know, that they will put on to go to work. Some of them have to pay for these um, uniforms and all of that. And so psychologically, I think there's a lot that needed to be done. You can't give what you don't have. So we, we can't expect much from the, the police, the way they are set up currently in terms of addressing um, crisis issues, uh, whether, whether at home or, or, or anywhere as it affects the safety of the of the of the citizens that's very interesting obb so in the united states um there's a lot of conversation about reducing the the budget for police departments but it's not like in nigeria you know the police are so underfunded that it's actually contributing to a lack of professionalism and to corruption and, and false arrests and things like that absolutely Do you want to share any more about that yes yes thank you for raising that so you know, even within Africa, you know, looking at Nigeria, looking at Kenya, looking at Tanzania, looking at Ghana, even Cameroon, you know, right here, Nigeria is the, Nigeria police is the least paid in terms of the average uh, take home um, um, salary of, 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 the, of the police officer. So the, the police in Nigeria needs more funding, but also needs to be more accountable and to be more transparent in the way and manner they utilize the resources that is made available to them. Thank you, OBB. So in, in Chicago, the, the situation is, is a little different, right? Um, Eddie, what kind of investments are needed to both reform police and enhance public safety? So Sophia, I think that we're in a really critical time here in our country, right? When we think about um, race and equity and opportunity. I think it's it's for the first time and given COVID been um, for the side of criminal justice it's actually been a kind of a, a, a plus um, particularly because it has unveiled right a lot of the flaws that we have within our criminal justice system and the way in terms of government how society really uh, puts more emphasis and dollars behind punitive approaches versus proactive and supported services for people who are, who are in the margins or people who are in need, right? So I hope that at the end of this this pandemic, right, that we get to reflect and reprioritize how we value people. And one of the ways that we demonstrate that value is by where we put our money at. Bottom line. So when I hear OBB about police officers not being paid uh, well or, or not even close to that, that just me where government is prioritizing public safety there. And so I say that to simply say that even in our city of Chicago, I have to constantly be questioning and ideally put our agency right to push the city um, to, to rethink about what public safety really is and what does it really take to make our communities much safer without hiring more police. Because the, what the data is telling us right now, what research has told us that having more police officers in a community, in a city, does not equate to a safer community. And that is that is very true. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, uh, you know, this, this idea of, of, I'll give you an example as, as a matter of fact. So just last year alone, our city spent over $200 million in police overtime and court settlements. By court settlements, I mean every single time there was a shooting, 
there was a homicide, there was an injury that involved the police, taxpayers, taxpayers paid that money. And so I think that, that the city, right, as government, they have a responsibility to steward people's uh, limited dollars and to leverage those dollars where they can have the most impact. And I believe that to, in today's climate, in our country at least, um, we could use what's going on in our country to really make the argument, to make a strong argument, why we need to rethink public safety, why we need to think about our police budget and how we could best collaborate with other institutions within government and in the community to maximize and to be more efficient with our resources. OBB, would, would you like to add anything? So absolutely, absolutely. You know, the, the police um, in, in Nigeria, there's a slogan that the police is your friend. The police is your friend. But I tell you, it's rhetorics. There is, I, I can tell you that the number of Nigerians who are happy with the police are far less, far less than the number of Nigerians who are deeply, deeply angered by the activities of the Nigerian police because they are not doing what constitutionally they are supposed to be doing, which is protecting you know, lives and properties, which is the safety of the citizens. And, and I, I think if the police goes through a proper reform, and there has been a lot of calls for reform over the years, I just hope that the government will be sincere this time around considering the, the, the experiences of the, of the protests and all of that that happened recently, that Ni the Nigerian government, you know, the legislators, the, 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 the entire, you know, government will be sincere about, you know, the reforms that we are talking about, that will make the police a, 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 a true friend of the people. Talk about community policing, for example. Like Eddie said, it's not just about the number of police that you have in the country. It, 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 it's about efficiency, it's about effectiveness, it's about the collaboration, you know, it's about partnership, you know, with the police force to be able to fight crime, to be able to fight injustice, to be able to, like the police is supposed to epitomize justice. If I am, if I am, um, or, uh, I mean, attacked or I am robbed or something, I should be able to run to the police and, and make a case. Any true reform has to be holistic. Any true reform has to be sincere. There has to be commitment to implementing those reforms if the country is going to move forward. Um, so as far as police reform recommendations, we're talking a lot about police accountability, funding streams, uh, community policing, training and mental health for police officers, deploying social workers to crises so that police can focus more on solving homicides, um, and also investment in communities. What about restorative justice? Currently, there's a lot of discussion on restorative justice and how it can do maybe a better job Report, uh, repairing the harm done to victims and a better job preventing further crime than uh, more punitive traditional criminal justice approaches. How is Heartland Alliance pioneering restorative justice practices in its own work? Some examples that I'll tell you right now, just within the wheelhouse of Red Chicago, and a lot of it's been, has been uh, spearheaded by yours truly, who's facilitating this conversation today, Sophia Emanuel, who is doing a lot of work in the Department of Corrections uh, from providing healing circles to restorative justice practices, introductions there uh, at the Department of Corrections. So we're talking about um, several institutions, close to 40 you know, prison institutions with about 35,000 men who are currently incarcerated. And we're just beginning right to scratch the surface. We've been going into one institution. We want to continue to expand that work to introduce people the principles and philosophies of restorative justice. And one of the ways that we're doing that is by also providing space for healing, for conversation, right? It is really important that we're able to build those relationships before we go into like, hey, how do we repair harm? Particularly when we, when, when in this case, we might not have the access to bring the victim in some cases, right, with the offender and, and, and mitigate some of that conflict 
or really think about a restorative justice approach to that. And we are working towards that. The second thing is on the ground. On the ground, we are doing that here in, in our communities in Chicago. Um, most of our staff have been trained on restorative justice practices. You know, it's a three-day training that we do. Uh, and it's infused in our culture of trauma-informed, right? We are aiming, we are, we are aspiring, right? To be as well informed about trauma as we possibly can so that we could maintain these relationships and so that we could do right by the men and women that we serve and our staff, ultimately. I say staff because most, much of our ready Chicago staff have been victims of violence, have been perpetrators of violence. They've been part of the criminal justice system. They survived all that. So we also have to make sure that we equip them with the right tools where they can reflect and therefore be able to practice what they're preaching as well. And we realized most of the time that the men that were serving uh, the night before somebody was killed and shot, you know, um, the night before there was a domestic dispute in their homes or the night before they had nowhere to sleep. They had to sleep in a, you know, in a hallway or in a gangway in their, in their city. So those are the things that we're also learning along the way when we do this. And it really allows us to empathize. And by empathy, I truly mean to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and allow the other person to be in your shoes. And that is a form of restorative justice. Now, there's more examples that I could give, but I'll, those are some that I'll just highlight for right now in terms of this conversation. Well, first, OBB, I wanted to see if you wanted to share anything about um, any movements towards restorative justice that um, is happening in Nigeria. So as, as, as Heartland Alliance, we believe that there is no justice without healing and there is no healing without justice. And so in some of the cases where we have um, community members who were arrested, I remember, I think two years ago, a, a, a sex worker was, um, uh, in, in attempt to arrest a sex worker, she was trying to get away and she got um, electrocuted, you know, and the police who was responsible for this tried to escape, but the community people around, you know, stopped him and he was arrested and Heartland Alliance, you know, worked with the National Human Rights Commission to ensure that this case was tried in court and the, the police, you know, uh, 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 was punished. And then the police was also asked to pay compensation to the family of this uh, uh, lady, you know, you know, who was killed, you know, uh, because, you know, as a result of the, the police action. Thank you, OBB. Yeah, so um, for, for our participants, for our communities to heal from, from violence and from police violence, we need not just mental health and, and restorative justice, but also we need, to, we need to see justice and and police reform. You know, OBB, you mentioned about the, the protests in Nigeria. Eddie, I don't know if you have a minute to, to weigh in on how can we balance protest, protection of property, healing, and a need to be heard? Yeah, so I think there's two, a couple of things that I'll say briefly. One is when you see media, uh, people rioting and, and looting, right? And most of the time they're showing faces of black or brown people. Um, that represents a very small population in comparison to all the peaceful marches and protests that, that have occurred. But the irony that I also see is depending on who's telling the story, when you have college students, you know, after a, a championship of a, of, a, of a football team and they're doing the same thing, they don't call it looting. They call it totally something more positive. So language truly does matter at the end of the day, right? And it's because of who they see, right? And the issues that they work on or that they're, they're working towards or fighting or celebrating. Now, I would also say there's a sense of urgency because too many black and brown people are being killed and being harmed by the same systems they claim to protect us. And so with that note, I would simply say this. We have close to 700 men in Red Chicago right now. I often think about these are men that over, well over 200 of them have been victims of gun violence. Imagine if we organize them. Imagine if we train them around community organizing. We empower them as leaders as they are to be civically engaged in which they want to be civically engaged. They want to go out there. They want to talk about their stories. They want to change systems. We could be that bridge. We could be that avenue as an organization and bring their voice front and center of the same issues that we're discussing here today, whether it's police reform, whether it's about more support service for victims, whether it's about gun issues, whether it's around 
equity and human rights, whether it's same marriage, whether it's in, 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 in foreign countries um, or here in the United States, our, our clients, our participants, our staff, the 1800 staff that we have across the Alliance, it is a powerful voice. And we're able to have a collective voice together. And that's why I'll end with this last thought, which is individually, each one of us, it doesn't matter what position you're in. It doesn't matter if, 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 you're, if you're, you're the person who's, who's cleaning up our offices, it doesn't matter if you're the person who's simply interviewing people uh, in terms of for focus groups or in terms of a story or in terms of just like pushing things along. Each one of us has a responsibility and we have the power to make a difference in the lives of so many especially if we're able to do our work as effectively, as efficiently as possible, so that as a unit, we can maximize our strengths and have a larger impact. And that's what I believe is the power of the Alliance, the Alliance. It is powerful to me. On that note, I thank you for your time. Sophia, thank you so much for the wonderful uh, interview slash you know, moderating this conversation. OBB, I, I hope in, in time I get to meet you in person. I really love the opportunity of, of just doing this work and I just feel extremely blessed.